The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the first of our four summer sessions in our Issues in National Security Lecture Series. I'm John Jackson and I will serve as host for today's event. Admiral Chatfield is unable to join us today, but I'm pleased to welcome you on her behalf. This series is a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body, as well as the entire Naval War College extended family, including members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport, and participants from around the nation. Looking ahead on Tuesday, July 13th, Professor Tom Nichols will speak about his nationally recognized book, The Death of Expertise. I'm sure you will find this discussion to be very interesting in the digitally connected world in which we live. Okay, on with the main event. Uh, during the presentations that follow, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the two presentations. One of the true jewels of the college's excellent academic offerings is the electives program. Each trimester, students are allowed to register for one of the dozens of courses that are available. Our first presenter will speak briefly about this very popular program, and then he'll discuss his new elect. Dr. Tim Schultz is the college's Associate Dean of Academics. Prior to joining the Newport faculty in 2012, he served as the Dean of the U.S. Air Force's School of Advanced Air and Space Studies at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. Tim earned his PhD in the history of science and technology from Duke University in 2007. His research interests include the interaction between technology and strategy and the transformative nature of automation and warfare. He's a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy, Colorado State University, the Air Command and Staff College, and the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. Formerly a U.S. Air Force Colonel, he spent much of his aviation career as a U-2 pilot enjoying the view over very interesting regions of the globe. I will introduce our second speaker after Tim's presentation. So I'm pleased to pass the digital baton to one of the smartest guys that I know, Professor Tim Schultz. Over to you, Tim. Thank you, Professor John Jackson. That just tells me you need to meet more people. <laughs> and thank you for carving out this time. And also to you, Gary Ross and the whole uh, IRD team for putting all of this together. And you know, we have the, to, the opportunity to engage with each other in an intellectual way over the summer. It's just a fantastic idea. And I'm very pleased to, to help kick this off with my, my cohort, Jay Dancy, Dr. Jay Dancy, who's going to talk in the second half about uh, something we both love to do, and that's teach electives. So let me start sharing my screen because I want to tell you some more about this great program before we get into the, the sampler portion where we talk about a, a couple of different electives. Okay, so just briefly, a, a brief overview of the Naval War College electives program. This is part of every student's experience in the resident program. Uh, it, it amplifies, augments, oxygenates their core curriculum. It wouldn't be possible without the three people that I named below, the program manager, Jen Sheridan, uh, our uh, contractor, project manager, Patty Duke, and our brand new admin assistant, Jessica Boggs, plus this team from, from IRD and AV who make everything come together. And so we, we so appreciate everybody's role in creating something special for our students. It lets us offer about 70 courses every year, 70 very different courses. It lets students explore beyond the core, something really important to their intellectual development. And it also showcases faculty expertise. And we think that's a, a powerful expression of the diverse of faculty that we have here at the Naval War College. 
So our War College electives professors, they come from throughout the college, from the different deaneries, from the College of Leadership and Education, Center for Naval Warfare Studies, the Dean of Academics, uh, and elsewhere we have adjuncts who help us out. And every year, these professors tend to show up. These are some of our hardy perennials and students like to learn about what these folks have to say. And it's translated through our resident and adjunct professors. And we get to expose students and let them do a deeper dive in subjects like say um, space technology and policy and the climate change in the Arctic and cyber warfare and unmanned systems and nuclear technology and deterrence and leadership and ethics and women in war and combat and civil military relations, all areas that, uh, that different students have very uh, uh, keen interest in. And we create the opportunity where hopefully they'll get one of their top uh, choices of elective that they can go into in any given trimester. And so this is what we, uh, we work together to create. And it's with the great staff and faculty that we're able to do it. And it brings me now to where we can talk a little bit about a couple of brand new electives that were just offered this last year. Uh, one that I did uh, called Science Fiction, Ideations and Explorations for Modern Leaders. And in about 20 minutes or so, I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, Professor Jay Dancy, and he'll talk about his new course, Film War in Society in America. And we chose these as two examples of very different courses with uh, different focus, different methodologies, and, and just to kind of show some of the, uh, the diversity that's going on in your electives program. So let me start out with this science fiction course. And many of you might be wondering, and it's a fair question, why teach a course on science fiction in professional military education? Why have a sci-fi course at the Naval War College? I'm gonna answer that question here uh, by describing the major elements of the course. Specifically, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the specific purpose or purposes of the course. I'm gonna explain some of the material that we used and the structure that we used along the way. This is the, all of our electives. They're just two credit courses. They meet uh, 10 weeks in a row and each week they'll meet for a th one three hour long seminar and it's up to professors to develop the structure and methods within that course. So I'll talk about the methods I used as well, and then maybe get into some of the results of the course from a, uh, from a student perspective, not just you know, the, the professor's perspective. So let me expand a little bit on the purpose of a science fiction course. One of the authors that we read says that sci-fi is a literature always in the state of becoming, a literature that is born on the frontier between the known and the unknown. I like that quote. That resonates with me because the frontier between the known and the unknown, isn't that exactly where Naval War College graduates operate? That is where they think, that is where they lead, and that is where they fight, sort of in that shadowlands between the known and the unknown. And we want them to become better equipped um, resilient, uh, anti-fragile, if you will, by de developing abilities to consider and examine alternative futures and dynamic situations and sort of think differently. To examine how ideas translate into reality in human affairs, science fiction tells us something about that. It tells us something about uh, how to think about technological change and war and politics and ethics and disease and all of that wrapped around human nature. And it also, and this is extremely important, I think, it helps us educate leaders who reimagine rather than just reinforce the status quo. That is a purpose of this course. It is a purpose of the electives program. And writ large, it is a purpose of the Naval War College to educate our future leaders to reimagine rather than just reinforce that status quo. So let me talk a little bit about the material that was developed to, uh, to execute this course. And it involved three different things, some canonical or classic science fiction, some very new science fiction, and also some articles written by various scholars in and outside of the, uh, the science fiction literature. Here's a, a list of the canonical sci-fi. Many of you will recognize uh, these people or, or their work, uh, Mary Shelley, uh, Frankenstein, she wrote it in 1818. It's, it's really the first truly science fiction novel ever written. 
Uh, Isaac Asimov, we read several of his short stories to include the one he wrote in 1942 called Runaround, where he introduces the three laws of robotics, which permeate the, the next uh, you know, uh, 80 years of science fiction thinking and literature. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke wrote a great short story called Superiority, where, guess what, the high-tech side, the superior side, loses and loses badly. That is an important lesson to consider for our students. But the biggest book we read is Dune, Frank Herbert's towering classic, and that's followed by um, a military sci-fi book called The Forever War, written by a Vietnam veteran, Joe Haldeman. They read Michael Crichton's Andromeda Strain. He wrote, that was his first book back in 1969. And it's really created a, a, a pathway and was extremely influential in, um, yeah, in and outside of the science fiction literature. And we also read um, a couple of Hugo award-winning sci-fi authors, uh, Octavia Butler and Ursula K. Le Guin, their short stories, which really resonated with the students uh, um, throughout the course. So that's part of the sci-fi canon, uh, really a, a small part of it. I also wove in some new science fiction for students to consider. And we did watch uh, some, uh, some sci-fi, it wasn't all just reading. Uh, and they watched the three hour pilot to the new reimagined Battlestar Galactica series, uh, which really gets into some deep lessons about leadership and some ethical dilemmas. We had them read a, a Xi Xin Lu's Three Body Problem. He's a Chinese uh, author. Well, I'll talk more about him later. Um, if you wanna read a laugh out loud book, uh, something really hilarious and learn about artificial intelligence. Read Martha Wells, All Systems Red. Some of you saw the book, the movie World War Z, terrible movie with uh, Brad Pitt, mediocre movie maybe. The book is excellent. It's by Max Brooks, the son of Mel Brooks. And it describes how societies react to unforeseen changes. So that's useful to us. And we read a recent book called Burn In by Peter Singer and August Cole, uh, which is kind of a near-term look at the future in a pretty rigorous academic way. And in terms of other sort of an academic perspectives, we wove in a lot of scholarly articles and I'm not gonna detail all of these here. These are just some of them, but I'll mention two of them. Uh, they read uh, an article written by Alan Turing in 1950. It's a 70 year old article and it talks about his thoughts about how to tell the difference between if you're engaging with a human or if you're getting uh, engaging with a computer intelligence. This is what he called the imitation game, which we now know as the Turing test. Another article that, that really uh, impacted the students in the course is by Lisa Masseri called Anticipatory Discourse and the Projectory in Technological Communities, fancy title, but really she's getting at this notion of a projectory or a projection or a trajectory of what's going to happen in the near future and it's how organizations actually write the history of the near future with technology that is still under development. And militaries do that all of the time. NASA does that all of the time. Uh, Sci-fi literature can tell us something about that because that's something that will be expected of our graduates as they ascend the higher levels of leadership. So let me get in a little bit into the structure of the course. As I mentioned, all electives are, are 10 lessons, they're 10 weeks long, two credits, meet in a three hour seminar each of those weeks. Here's how I broke down those 10 lessons for this course. And I started out with some general perspectives on science fiction. Uh, SF can also mean speculative fiction. That's another way to view this course. Uh, and then the first major book I had them read was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein from 1818. Most of them hadn't read it. Most of them had seen the movies. Most movies are nothing like the book. The book is, is profound in many ways. I'm gonna talk a little bit um, uh, more about, uh, about um, uh, Frankenstein here in a bit. I had him do a lesson on AI and cyborgs. Both of these terms um, are over 60 years old and we had them do some readings to kind of help contextualize what those mean. And then we spent a whole lesson on fictions or fiction intelligence or how the power of story, the power of a forward-looking narrative can help translate ideas into reality. And I'll talk uh, more about, um, about that uh, and what Peter Singer did with the novel Burn-In to, to do that, along with his co-author, August Cole. 
We spent a whole lesson on science fiction and ethics. And as I evolve and change this course, I'm going to move that ethics course, the ethics lesson, excuse me, much earlier in the course because the students kept coming back to the readings from this lesson, specifically one by Ursula K. Le Guin called The Ones Who Walk Away from a Mellis, powerfully uh, impacted our students. We spent a whole course on politics and strategy uh, by reading Frank Herbert's novel Dune, which is all about this um, this notion of, of power politics and um, how uh, the, the, the so-called real world works in political realism or what we call real politique, this relationship between uh, organizations, between people and militaries and governments. Uh, and it connects with something they read in the core course, uh, Thucydides, history of the Penel Peloponnesian War. Uh, he's the father of realism. He gets into these notions of how fear, honor and interest uh, sort of animates uh, human affairs. Well, we see that come to life in the Dune universe. So it's a different lens that the students can use. Naturally, we did a whole lesson on pandemics. That was where the Michael Crichton uh, reading on Andromeda Strain came in. Uh, and then military science fiction. Um, the Forever War is kind of resonates with our students who have experienced in this century, the long war. And then we spend some time talking about dystopic, dystopic futures or maybe some utopia type of scenarios. In the last lesson, I, I switched directions with them and introduced them to some Chinese science fiction. That was the book, The Three-Body Problem, plus some short stories. How, you know, what do we know about science fiction from a non-Western perspective? What does this, that tell us about universal themes in human affairs? And it is a very powerful um, book and gets really at uh, some fascinating Chinese perspectives. I also want to mention some of the methods that we used in the course because I encourage our professors throughout the electives program to try new things and new methods. So I did the same with this course. Um, I had 12 students and every week three of them were the designated as the geeks of the week. That means they run the seminar that week. They run the facilitated discussion, the Socratic dialogue about that week's readings, and they're eliciting the viewpoints and counterarguments from their peers. I thought this was important for their development because this is something that leaders need to be good at. They need to be able to sit around a table with intelligent people and draw out diverse and complex points of view and find ways to connect them all together. It's more evidence that Really, in reality, this was a leadership course just disguised as a science fiction course. The students were flexible in their approach to the papers. Instead of saying your papers are due on these dates, I said, you've got three papers due throughout the course. You choose the dates when they're due. The students were taken aback by that degree of flexibility. It was an experiment and it worked. They deconflicted with each other. They found what worked for them and I helped it, I think it helped their creativity in the long process. And then since all of this was online last year, we used the discussion board a lot, and I'll get to that uh, here in a bit. But I want to talk about some of the general results, the things that sort of manifested in this course, things that I think that students learned. And one of them is that good science fiction, good speculative fiction is timeless. Uh, one uh, scholar of science fiction, Gary K. Wolf, says that good science fiction is temporally fluid. And that just means that it applies in all ages. It applies even for decades after it was written. And I'm going to give, I'm giving you an example of that here with this quote from one of the characters from one of our readings. And you can read it here, but I'll read it out loud as well. This character said, I found myself similar, yet at the same time, strangely unlike the beings concerning whom I read and to whose conversation I was a listener. I sympathized with and partly understood them but I was unformed in mind. And you would think that is maybe some type of robotic character who's developing some form of sapience and intelligence and is trying to learn about the real world. But it, so something from a contemporary novel, it was not contemporary at all. Th those are the words of Frankenstein's creature, the monster from the novel Frankenstein. He is left unformed in his education. He's exposed to humans and he's trying to absorb reality and figure out and develop his own intellectual understanding of the world. But he fails at that. And instead he becomes this, what they call in the book, uh, the demon. He, he becomes reckless and, and evil. 
And there's a lesson here that Mary Shelley was trying to tell our students that the original sin was on the part of Victor Frankenstein. He created this technology, this thing he sewed together, and then he abandoned it. He ignored it. His, this, this Frankenstein's creation was a form of technology that went out of control because of Dr. Frankenstein's neglect and lack of foresight. So Mary Shelley is here is depicting a creator, not a creation who was fundamentally flawed. And the students got that lesson. They understood that, that what are we doing today as creators that are that is might be fundamentally flawed that might manifest itself in very regrettable ways in the future. So there's a timeless nature here. Some of the other results uh, that we saw in, for example, the discussion board, it sparked the creativity of, of these students. I asked them a question each week. The first week I asked them to answer this question on the on the discussion board is, are you alive? Provide evidence you are a sentient being and not a machine. Basically pass the Turing test by convincing your classmates you are not an artificial intelligence by describing something on the discussion board. And that was really a challenge for our students. I asked them if Mary Shelley was born 200 years later, what would she have written about in our modern era? Um, I asked them, okay, propose your own speculative fiction or science fiction story that prepares us for a possible future. And I'm glad I asked that question because they came up with some fascinating ideas. And it affirmed to me that our leaders, our students, our future senior leaders, they really aspire to create. Uh, here are some of the, um, the speculations that they came up with. One of them was a self-aware, deeply interconnected city uh, that becomes this authoritarian dystopic overlord as it prioritizes the safety of its residents, their security, but not their freedom and their, and their God-given inalienable rights. Another had this really creepy idea of, about genetic, genetically modified organisms or foodstuffs when bought to the supermarket. What if they start turning the customers into a form of food? Uh, got, gets in ideas about genetic engineering. Um, I'll bump to the bottom one there. Uh, one student came up with this notion of a smart home that can monitor the residents. And in an era of a pandemic, it will closely uh, uh, identify any symptoms of a disease. Say if Johnny's walking down the stairs and he's coughing and he has a fever, well now the smart home locks the doors, locks the windows, calls the CDC and, and prevents the family from leaving for the sake of public health. So you can kind of get an idea of, of why the students were thinking about that. Some of the student observations of the course were instructive to me. They liked the notion of exploring non-traditional means of strategy development and decision-making, which is fundamental to the War College curriculum. Um, they uh, thought that um, it's good to, to have to critically think about risks and opportunity in new technology. Um, one of them, after reading Dune, he saw some resonance in terms of our space policy with regard to how we safeguard our satellites from uh, different interests, internal and uh, external uh, interests. Um, another student, I don't have it here, he said really the great part of the course for him, and I, I think this is true with many electives, is seeing the diversity of thought when a group of students, they're all assigned the same reading, the same text, and they draw vastly different takeaways. And then they clash those together with each other. And that's where true learning takes place. In keeping with some of the other results I observed, some uh, I asked students for their recommendations. Uh, they like the notion of Chinese science fiction and they recommend, hey, let's, let's even go further and get to some other cultures. There's a growing literature about of uh, uh, science fiction written by uh, African authors. It's called Afrofuturism. Um, that's something that we may be able to incorporate in the future. Others want to learn more about this fictional intelligence um, uh, concept that I mentioned. Others uh, offered up some of the hardy perennials that most of us are familiar with, like Ender's Game and, and Starship Troopers and Brave New World, things that we would I would love to incorporate and may incorporate in future iterations of the course as it uh, as it uh, continues to evolve. So what's next for this course? And, and I asked the same question really for any course offered at the Naval War College. Um, I will offer it again, uh, and I'm going to uh, make adjustments and, and, and tweak it here and there and get another data point of another semester. 
Uh, I was really heartened by something that happened that I didn't anticipate from the students. And after the semester was over, after the course ended, they, uh, a few of them, not all of them, but a few of them, they formed their own book club and they called it the Society for Continuing Ideations on Fiction and Imagination or Sci-Fi. And they met online on a Sunday evening once a month to discuss the book they had read that month that went beyond the Naval War College curriculum, you know, some, uh, some a science fiction novel. And to me, that means that their graduate education was really resonating with them. They were taking it an extra mile. They were engaging with each other. They were growing intellectually and developing new habits of mind as they, uh, as they continue to understand the broader world. So I'll leave you with a, a few quotes that I think help describe why a science fiction course is relevant to the Naval War College. One of them is by uh, uh, the Chinese author, Xi Xin Lu, who wrote Three Body Problem. And he says, science fiction is a literature of possibilities. I think that's important because leadership is about possibilities. So if we can expose students to a literature of possibilities, might that make them better leaders? Might that help them see things differently? Very similarly, another uh, Hugo award-winning sci-fi author, Nora Jemison, she says, we creators are the engineers of possibility. Well, strategists are the engineers of possibility. Leaders are the engineers of possibility. Our graduates, be they US military officers or international officers or civilian leaders across the, the interagency, for the rest of their professional lives, they are going to be engineers of possibility. We want them to, to imagine the future that should be and to colonize that future, to, to create that future before others create a different one, maybe one that is less beneficial to our Navy and our nation. And finally, uh, one of my favorite authors, he didn't make the cut because uh, his books are too long. Maybe in a future iteration, he'll, he'll make it. Uh, it's Neil Stevenson. He describes science fiction as an invisible magnetic field that roughly orients people's imaginations in the same technological directions. Useful quote, but I apply that to our graduates. They are entering a realm where they are the people who convert ideas into actions, convert ideas into reality. They need to align uh, people's thinking and, and the institutional budgets and institutional visions uh, to, uh, to, to align with their own vision of what the future should be like. They need to establish that trajectory of where they think we need to go in this uncertain future, a future which this course uh, hopefully exposed them to. So that, that's the gist of, of a rather different and unique course that we just offered that experimented with some new methods. If you want to know some more, I'm happy to send you the syllabus. You can contact me uh, at uh, either of these emails or hit me up on Twitter, and I will, um, I will gladly send you a, a copy of the syllabus if you so desire. Meanwhile, uh, John, let me hand it back over to you. I'm going to stop the screen sharing and... Um, let you uh, introduce the most venerable and awesome Dr. Jay Dancy. Very good. Thank, thank you, Tim. That's, uh, that's a fabulous presentation. I think you've probably got at least 83 folks who would like to take the course. So you may have to get a bigger classroom <laughs> because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of demand from those who would like to take it and maybe some that actually will be able to take it. So I love the uh, concept of geeks of the week because I've been one of those for uh, most of my adult life. So, uh, all right, thank you very much. Uh, we will now turn to uh, the second presenter. And uh, Jay Ross Dancy is an assistant professor in the Joint Military Operations Department and co-director of the Graduate Certificate in Maritime History here at the Naval War College. His research examines Naval administration, policy and manpower, as well as the veterans returning home from war. Professor Dancy holds a doctorate in history from the University of Oxford, as well as degrees from the University of Exeter and Appalachian State University. Formerly a US Marine infantryman, he served both in Afghanistan and Iraq. In 2020, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Historical Society for his original contributions to historical study. Here to talk about his superb elective is Professor Jay Dancy. Over to you, Jay. Thank you very much. 
And let me share my screen here. All right. Uh, thank you very much um, for that. Uh, I, I'd like to thank uh, thank you, uh, Professor Jackson, for the opportunity to talk about my class, uh, and uh, thank you to Tim Schultz and Electives uh, Office for uh, helping make that class a reality. Uh, it's it's really a, a, a joy to teach. Uh, I taught this class for the first time uh, this uh, last uh, winter trimester. Um, and it, uh, is, it's in conjunction with the uh, Graduate Certificate in Maritime History program uh, as an option for students to take uh, and a requirement for any students that enter uh, off cycle uh, into that program. Uh, I taught the class with uh, Mark Fiore, who's gonna be teaching again with me this year. Uh, and this class uh, this year mirrors very much an effort uh, that uh, myself and several other colleagues here at the Naval War College are putting together uh, and uh, working on a, uh, a handbook for World War II in the Pacific uh, for Rutledge. Uh, and there's, there's a film chapter in that book that uh, Rick Norton, Charlie Chadbourne and myself are, are working on. Uh, and uh, we've, we've had a few uh, uh, film nights uh, uh, across Zoom over uh, the, the past trimester and uh, are hoping to continue that in the future as we go forward. Um, so uh, this class, Film, uh, War, and Society uh, in America, uh, is, is a little bit of a, it, it comes out of um, a class that I taught in my previous job at Sam Houston State University. Uh, and it, it was a grant course there. Uh, and I, I took that course and I changed it to fit uh, this, this environment uh, and our students here. Uh, and I think it's, it's done really well. And I think probably it has more of an impact here than there. Um, the course itself, uh, I mean, the, the base question here is why study uh, film uh, or films at the Naval War College? Uh, and really, I bullet down to these, these sort of three principles, and they all feed back into each other. And it's, it's understanding and studying historiography, uh, understanding society's changing view of war over time, uh, and uh, the civil military divide. Uh, that, that we have in society. Uh, and this course does this effectively uh, by looking at uh, a, a fixed event in history, um, which is the Second World War. Granted, that's a, that's a very large event, but that's, that's what it looks at. Uh, and it, it views, uh, we view films chronologically as they were produced to look at how society's view of that conflict changed over time. So we, uh, we watch films made during the war, immediately after the war, uh, and uh, in, in, in the years that follow. Uh, and that's really, a lot of that is the backbone uh, of historiography. Uh, and, and, and really this historiography portion of this, uh, it's, it's, a it's a methodology for writing and understanding uh, history. Uh, it's sort of, it's the, uh, the medicine uh, um, that, that is sort of sneakily woven into the, uh, to the course. Uh, uh, Mary Poppins would say it's the, the, the teaspoon of sugar that helps the medicine go down, I, I guess. Um, uh, and, and understanding historiography is effectively the history of the history. Uh, so understanding how we produce history and the questions uh, that are asked. And this is heavily affected, of course, by changes in society. Uh, that very much affect the questions that we ask uh, and all, all of history and historical change. Uh, and of course, whether we're writing history or, or producing film, uh, we are undeniably in our time and those products are products of that time. Uh, so the questions that we ask of the Second World War today are very different from those asked in 1942 or 1970 or 1998. And at the same time, uh, we cannot, for instance, go back and view uh, Casablanca uh, with 1942 eyes. Uh, we can't unknow the eight decades of history uh, that have happened since. And I think uh, this E.H. Uh, e. Carr, um, uh, e. Carr's book, What is History from 1961, I think uh, this quote uh, sort of encapsulates that very well. Um, uh, when he says, uh, when we attempt to answer the question, what is history, our answer uh, consciously or unconsciously reflects our own position in time and forms part of our answer to the broader question, what view we take of the society in which we live. Uh, and I think this is a social history uh, concept. And I, I know a lot of people, particularly military historians, often sort of disdain the concept of social history. Uh, but it's very important because the stuff that we produce is, in fact, a part of that uh, and understanding that in a broader context. And I think for our future leaders or, or the officers uh, and civilian leaders that are here that come to the Naval War College, this is also 
uh, incredibly important. Um, so if we move on, we look at sort of society's changing view of war, uh, the other, the, the second of those three uh, uh, stool legs. Uh, this, the course really does that through viewing these films uh, over time. And we can see sort of the, uh, uh, the cyclical nature of a lot of this. These films uh, effectively are, are windows of the past. Um, and we can think of them as sort of flies in amber. For instance, they encapsulate the past. Uh, so the first movie uh, the, the, the class watches, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, it's the only film that is not a, uh, a film about World War II, but it really sets up the class to understand uh, America's concept of, uh, of foreign war in the 1930s. It is very much a film uh, that, is, uh, that looks at war as hell uh, and, um, and, and how it destroys uh, our humanity. Uh, fast forward 12 years uh, to, to Casablanca in 1942, uh, and it's a very different look. It's uh, Nazis are clearly evil, uh, and America must join this fight and do their part. Uh, fast forward uh, 20 years, uh, and 1962 to The Longest Day, a film, uh, a, a, a war epic about uh, D-Day in Europe. Uh, and this film is really uh, looking at the sort of the enormity of the effort put together uh, by the allies, and it very much speaks to the, the power of alliances. Of course, this is the height of the Cold War when that's uh, very important. Uh, continue forward to 1998, we see Saving Private Ryan, uh, a very popular film, which uh, a lot of most of the students have seen coming into the course, as opposed to the earlier films, uh, which is very much about sacrifice, uh, the greatest generation in their twilight years, uh, and looking back at, at, at that, and then uh, move forward 16 years to 2014 and Fury, uh, which is a film uh, about um, uh, war as hell uh, and how, uh, again, it destroys our humanity. So you see that sort of cyclic nature of, of how society views uh, these concepts. As we move forward and we talk about that civil military divide, which I think is a very important part of this and it's important for our students to understand, uh, this is something that has, uh, that divide has grown uh, very much over time. Uh, the slide here are uh, simply some article, um, article titles uh, that I pulled out uh, about that divide. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's very popular, popular uh, in academic articles. Um, you see a lot of this. Um, and effectively what that's saying is, is, is we look at how this changes. Um, in 1945, that civil military divide certainly existed, but American society had a much more intimate experience of military service and war. Uh, nearly everybody uh, knew someone who had fought if they hadn't, hadn't fought themselves. Industrial production involved the entire United States. Um, rationing uh, was something that everybody experienced. Many people uh, grew victory gardens, for instance, to help offset that. Uh, and there was a real threat to the home front. And today that's just not the case. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we're, we're pulling out of Afghanistan after 20 years um, and uh, the, the conflict barely hits the news uh, and it faded in, uh, very much in time as, as that conflict went on. Uh, in fact, public's generally more concerned with the next iPhone that's coming out than they are with uh, the conflict uh, that's going on. And this is important because the public learns a lot of its uh, history from film. Uh, so these feed back in uh, on each other. Uh, the general setup for the class uh, is uh, the class watches two films a week, uh, one film that is required, uh, and then another one that they have the option of, of, of watching from uh, a list. Uh, the, only week, the only week that's not true is week nine when they watch two required films, which are uh, uh, Clint Eastwood's two films about Iwo Jima. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, they also read roughly 75 pages each week. It's a mix of scholarly articles, uh, film reviews. They also read uh, most of the book, uh, Mark Harris's and Five Came Back, uh, which is a book uh, about the directors that, uh, that went to World War II, the Hollywood elites that actually put on a uniform uh, uh, and, and what they did during the war and when they came back. Um, uh, the course, uh, they have three assignments in the course. Uh, they write a historical film review, which is a thousand words, and is literally a, a review of a film uh, looking at its historical accuracy. Was it accurate? Uh, why or why not? Uh, delving into that. Uh, they, write, they write a film dissection paper, uh, and then they actually make a 10-minute presentation to the course as part of that. Um, uh, and they really get into the weeds of how the film was made uh, um, and all types of interesting stuff like that. And the presentations are, are really good and help inform the rest of the class. 
Uh, and then their, their big project um, is a 2,500-word historical film analysis, historiographical film analysis, I should say. Uh, and that really looks at change over time in film. And they don't have to stick to Second World War films on this. Uh, they, can, they can broaden out. So if they want to compare films made about uh, the Second World War with films made about Vietnam with, for instance, something like Hurt Locker, uh, they can do that. Uh, had a really good paper written about uh, comedy war films uh, in this, this past class that, that was absolutely uh, one of the best papers that I read. Uh, and you can see at the bottom of the page there, uh, each of the 10 weeks, these are the required films that, they're, uh, that they have to watch. Uh, the, the class can sort of be looked at as four phases uh, as we go through it. And the first uh, phase being weeks one through three, uh, which really looks at the transition into and through the Second World War. Uh, the second phase uh, is about remembering World War II and its intermediate and its immediate aftermath. Uh, the third phase looks at the Vietnam era through uh, the 1990s and the twilight of the greatest generation. And then the final phase uh, looks at, it ties the, the course themes together and looks at film war and society in uh, post 9-11 America. Uh, and in those phases, uh, we, 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 we can look at a lot of uh, different things. And this, this is driven uh, heavily by Socratic discussion and, and also message boards since this was an online class. Um, so uh, one of the great examples here uh, is, is the first two films are required to watch in weeks one and two. Um, and it is All Quiet on the Western Front, which is a film about the First World War. Uh, and then they, they can contrast that with, uh, with Casablanca, which is a, a 1942 film set in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Vichy French uh, Casablanca uh, at, the, at the beginning of the Second World War in Europe, or the, first, the, the initial years of the Second World War in Europe. Um, and, and there's some really interesting uh, differences in this film. They're, they're dramatically different. All Quiet on the Western Front, a, uh, a, a notable anti-war film. Um, and, and Paul Balmer, who is uh, the protagonist in the film, um, has, this, has this great quote. He, he gets wounded in the film. If you haven't seen it, he goes back uh, to his hometown for a few weeks. He's German. Uh, and he visits his old high school where uh, students are in class and they're literally learning uh, uh, about the uh, honor and, and, and duty and such things. Uh, and he, he sort of has a, a bit of a snap uh, and, and he, he stops the class uh, with his quote. And he says, you still think it's beautiful to die for your country. Uh, the first bombardment taught us better. When it comes to dying for country, it's better not to die at all. We can contrast that with, uh, with uh, Rick Blaine, played by Humphrey, Humphrey Bogard in uh, Casablanca. Uh, and it's the point of the film when, uh, when uh, Nazi aggression is becoming more evident in Vichy, uh, in Vichy Casablanca. Uh, and he's tearing down, selling everything off. And he has this great quote of, if it's December 1941 in Casablanca, what time is it in New York? I bet they're all asleep in New York. I bet they're asleep all over America. Uh, and this is a great, uh, a great quote uh, and it's right after he signed a bill that's dated 2nd December 1941. Uh, but it's a really great quote uh, about uh, American needing to get, uh, get involved in the war. So it's a transition from anti-war to support. Uh, the second phase of the class, uh, we, we look at uh, the films, uh, the class um, goes to the struggle of veteranhood, the, the coming home and the remembering of the war. So um, 1946, Best Years of Our Lives, an excellent film uh, about coming home from war. Uh, and we see uh, the three protagonists of the film, each dealing with, uh, with their service and dealing with coming home to the, to the same hometown in very different ways. Uh, uh, some doing much better than others, all having lots of problems. Uh, and we can fast forward uh, nine years uh, to, to the film To Hell and Back, which is, uh, Audie, is made from Audie Murphy's uh, autobiography, uh, the book about his experience, of course, Audie Murphy being the most highly decorated um, soldier uh, in U.S. history. Um, and it's his heroic telling of this uh, of World War II. And of course, those films at that point in time, uh, made 10 years after the war, uh, were watched heavily by audiences of veterans, uh, people that were uh, had, again, a very intimate understanding uh, of the war. So you see that sort of that movement and that transition of, of no longer supporting a war, but now looking back at the war and the sacrifice uh, and supporting those who, who fought in it. Uh, fast forward to the Vietnam era, uh, and we get some really interesting films, uh, and Patton has to be my, my favorite for this. Uh, and, and the main reason for this is Patton is this, this brilliantly written uh, film 
uh, and it, it doesn't come down on either side, uh, and it, it's a little bit unnerving. Um, uh, Robert Toplin, uh, in his uh, book History by Hollywood, uh, wrote, uh, the movie allowed people with diverse points of view to read their own message into the multi-dimensional story about a complex figure in history. Patton helped Americans articulate their heightened feelings with respect to the struggle in Vietnam and war in general. And it's, it's very true. You, you can see that as a heroic film. You can see that as a film about sacrifice. You can see that as a film uh, about a crazy man who gets lots of American soldiers killed because he's racing across uh, Sicily to beat the, uh, to, to beat the British. Um, it, it, it's really interesting. And the film doesn't come down, purposefully doesn't come down on, on either side. Uh, so it's really good. It's a, a Vietnam era uh, film. Also, I would highly recommend uh, Nick Sarantakis, one of my one of our colleagues here at the Naval War College, wrote a really good book about the making of Patton, uh, which is a deep dive into just getting this uh, project on on film in general. Uh, it's a really good book. There are other great books or great films uh, about this uh, uh, during this period of time. Uh, Dirty Dozen is a good example. Kelly's Heroes is a great example because it is a western about Vietnam set in World War II. Uh, and it's absolutely a uh, great film to dissect in class. Um, uh, students, uh, the students I found absolutely uh, love that film. It was a great uh, topic of conversation. Uh, and also in this, this uh, they, um, the, the end of this phase, the week following, we look at the 1990s, uh, and, uh, Saving Private Ryan as an example uh, of, of a film that they'll watch uh, and how that has changed in looking at uh, uh, World War II veterans or thinking about World War II veterans in their twilight years. Uh, uh, more than 40 years after the conflict. Uh, and then the final phase, the last two weeks, uh, weeks eight, or nine and 10 of the course, uh, week nine, uh, the students actually are required to watch two films. There's not an optional film choice this week. Um, and uh, that is uh, Eastwood's uh, two Iwo Jima's here, uh, Flags, of their Flags of Our Fathers, uh, which uh, uh, is an adaptation of a, of a great book, uh, and Letters from Iwo Jima. Uh, and these are two book, two films, both came out in 2006, both directed by Clint Eastwood. Uh, Flags of Our Fathers is very much about, about sacrifice and about what war does to, uh, to the veterans that come home uh, and the problems that they often have uh, integrating back into society. Uh, and Letters from Iwo Jima is a really interesting film that really humanizes the Japanese side of, of that struggle. Uh, and, and again, looks at sacrifice uh, in the face of, um, of basically a futile effort uh, to uh, uh, to try to uh, try to um, keep that island. Uh, really interesting films uh, that they watch. They also watch Fury uh, in the uh, in the final week of the course. Uh, so there there are several uh, several sort of timeless concepts that uh, come through this. Uh, one of these is, of course, the moral conflict within war. Uh, that we can look at and how that changes over time. Uh, here are three, uh, three scenes uh, from three different films that deal with that. Uh, the top, I'll fight on the Western Front. Uh, this is a scene, uh, Paul Bomber on the left there. Uh, during an assault and counter assault, uh, he ends up uh, being trapped in no man's land in a, in a giant shell hole. Uh, a French soldier jumps in with him and he mortally wounds him. Uh, and and he, uh, he, he talks to this guy. Uh, while he's dying and after he dies throughout an entire night, he stays in this uh, show with him and really has a nearly psychotic break uh, during this process. It points being mad at him, it points sympathizing with him, telling me, sorry, if, if it hadn't been a war, they could have been friends. Uh, he, he pulls a picture of his family out of his, out, out of his pocket and says he'll write them and, uh, and just really has this real issue with dealing with uh, the concept of, of, of having to kill this guy. Uh, the bottom left, you can see this, uh, uh, image from Saving Private Ryan. You know, many of you will be familiar with the film. Uh, this is right after uh, the uh, the Ranger Squad has uh, taken a machine gun nest. Their medic's been killed in the process. One of the German um, uh, machine gunners uh, has survived, uh, and they've had him basically dig his own grave and are about to execute him. Uh, when Captain Miller, played by uh, 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 Tom Hanks, uh, sort of is the, the, the moral interjection here and stops them with a, a story about his past. Uh, and it sort of reveals this, this concept, this moral concept that runs throughout the film of, of, of sacrifice and doing the right thing and that American always has to, has to be in, on the moral high ground. And we can contrast that with Fury in, in 2014, which has a very different approach to that. 
Uh, and this is a scene in Fury when uh, uh, Ward Eddy, played by Brad Pitt, uh, is basically handing a, a gun to the new guy. Uh, they've just uh, overrun a German position. There's a German POW there in the foreground on his knees. Um, and eventually, um, um, Brad Pitt's character uh, wrestles the new guy to the ground and literally holds the gun out and forces him to shoot this German POW in the back. And it's this, the, the message that comes with Fury is this, uh, is this message of morality is the morality of war is effectively winning, ending it as soon as, as possible. And that war itself uh, turns good men into monsters in order to, uh, in order to do that. Uh, and that's what comes through. So it's a very different shift in how all this, uh, how, how, how this deals with all these. And these are, of course, reflections uh, of the society and time in which they're made. Uh, and there are also other timeless themes, uh, such as, uh, and this is one of my favorite, uh, uh, modernity does not equal quality. Uh, and, and you can see this in, the, in, in 1930, All Quiet on the Western Front is an amazingly well-written uh, uh, screenplay, a really well-done film. Uh, uh, even with the limited special effects they had at the time, it, it, it is a very encompassing film. If you haven't seen it, I do urge you to go out and uh, 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 have a look and uh, get a copy of it. Uh, the the you can compare that, for instance, with uh, Pearl Harbor, which is is in the running for one of the worst films about World War II. Um, and uh, you can see here the the two uh, the two reviews uh, of these of these films from their from their time. Edward Shallot. Uh, praising uh, the quality and the ability of uh, producing uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. And in, on, in contrast, Anthony Lane, The New Yorker in 2001, uh, wrote that the effect of watching a Michael Bay film is indistinguishable from having a large pointy lump of rock dropped on your head, uh, which I think is an amazing uh, uh, review of that film. Uh, so we return uh, to this, this concept of why study films at the Naval War College uh, and that is very much, uh, it, it's about the historiography, understanding uh, history is important for, I, I believe it's important for our military leaders, understanding how history is made is equally important. Uh, it's a difference in sort of uh, 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 consuming the sausage and, and knowing what goes into the sausage um, is, is very different. Being, being, a, being a consumer and being a producer have uh, put you in two very different perspectives. Of course, society's, society's changing view of war, uh, understanding how society's uh, views of war change is important. Uh, American society gets a large portion of its, of its history from Hollywood, and uh, uh, Hollywood is also a reflection of that society. So these two feed back into each other. Um, and of course, our military can't function without society backing. Uh, when we try, it's, it's been a disaster, and uh, Vietnam's a great example of that. And again, that civil military divide, which with a smaller percentage of our population serving, uh, that, that divide uh, continues to grow. Uh, so at that, I will, uh, I will say thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity to present here. And uh, I'm, you can contact me at uh, my email address there at the bottom. Uh, I'm happy to share, uh, share the syllabus with you or discuss this uh, 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 at length. So and at that point, I will turn it back over. Thank you, Jay. That was uh, <clears throat> was an outstanding rundown. If anybody thought this was an easy elective, you just had to watch a few movies. I think you were clear in uh, explaining how important it is and the level of effort that you expect from your students. So uh, we've got time for a few questions. So uh, let me bounce uh, first back to Tim Schultz and uh, uh, question the your elective seems to have a very heavy reading load. Has that been a problem or have the students been able to uh, handle that level of effort? That was really my, my primary concern, John, is we, for a typical elective that meets three hours a week, the students have allotted to them six hours a week outside of the classroom. So six hours to prepare for the upcoming three hour seminar. Uh, and it's hard to read a, um, a big novel uh, in six hours. So what I did is uh, I interspersed the whole 10 lesson arc with a heavy reading week and then a lighter reading week and a heavy reading week and then a lighter re reading week. And then also letting the students choose which weeks they're gonna turn their papers in. Over that 10 week arc, I tried to moderate the workload um, and told them they would have to use a little bit of innovation on how to make that work. And I think I still need to dial it back a little bit on the page count. Um, but some of these novels are pretty quick reads. Others, some of the, the uh, scholarly articles are slower reads. 
And so it's just a matter of finding that right combination. And uh, I warn the students up front, you know, this is, we're not going to, you know, um, it, it, the topic might sound light, but this is a heavy, hardcore graduate level course. So strap in. Second question is, uh, what books almost made the list? Uh, for instance, why Handelman, Vice Heinlein, or Herbert versus Leakey? Yeah. Um, uh, Robert Heinlein, he, uh, he was just, he was as close as possible to making the cut as you can be and not make it. Um, I, I want to include, and I might in this upcoming version, uh, his book, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Um, fascinating story. Uh, you learn a lot about uh, uh, politics and insurgencies from that book. Um, and then there's, you know, Starship Troopers and others. Um, Heinlein is a, uh, um, a former naval officer. Uh, he served under uh, uh, Ernest J. King when Ernest J. King was a captain. Uh, he was influenced by uh, uh, King uh, significantly. One of our War College colleagues is writing a book um, a biography of, of Admiral King, and at least one chapter is going to be uh, on his interaction with Heinlein or Heinlein's interaction with King. I've been goading him, finish the book. I want to assign that chapter in my course so students can get a different perspective of Robert Heinlein and how his interactions with one of the most famous admirals in the U.S. Navy throughout history um, influenced this, one of the most famous sci-fi authors in history. So um, other books that I wanted to put in, but quite didn't quite make it. Uh, Andy Weir was mentioned. Um, he has several books out there. The Martian, Artemis, uh, New One Project, Hail Mary, all of them fascinating. Uh, Flowers for Algernon is, is uh, really good in terms of ethics. Uh, Change Agent by Daniel Suarez, a newer sci-fi book about genetic engineering. Neil Stevenson's The Diamond Age. And so as the, if the course continues and evolves, those will rotate in and out, I think. Good, thank you. Uh, Jay, we had one uh, comment uh, given a little pushback on Casablanca and why that is considered a war movie. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, so the, the films that we watch in, in this class, uh, war film is, uh, doesn't necessarily mean a combat film. Uh, so in this case, Casablanca is very much a film about uh, sort of a, a higher level. It's looking at uh, uh, it won at uh, Europe and, of course, North Africa, uh, European colonies being overrun uh, by, uh, by, uh, by not the Nazi advance in Europe and, and sort of uh, the, the consumption of Europe in war and the consumption ultimately of the world in war. Uh, so really, it looks at it at that level uh, and the call for uh, America to get involved, which is very much uh, looking at it. And you see uh, uh, sort of the final scene is, uh, is, is uh, Rick Blaine. Uh, played by Humphrey Bogart and the uh, the French captain walking, police captain walking away, uh, basically talking about this is going. To, I think this is going to be a very good friendship, right? Uh, that sort of approach to uh, America joining the war and, and uh, the, the ultimate. Uh, of course, in 1942, that wasn't obvious, but the ultimate uh, 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 victory that they were looking for in Europe uh, with American help. And I'd like you to react to this uh, comment, which I have seen reported that uh, someone would say, I didn't serve in Vietnam, but I saw platoon three times. What does, how do you react to that comment? Uh, I, I think there's, uh, I, I see a lot of that. Um, it is, and, and this is again, that, that civil military divide. And I think understanding that is uh, so much of America uh, gets their history uh, from, from Hollywood. Uh, and, and I think that the, the, there is no film that can accurately portray war. I, I think a lot of uh, directors have, have tried very hard. Uh, I think there are some films that come close. Uh, Saving Private Ryan uh, does a, a fairly good job of it, but there's, there's no amount of, of, uh, of violence or action or anything that you can put on a screen that is the same as, as being there and seeing it in person. Um, and I, I think that's where that uh, a lot of that civil military divide comes from. And as we move forward, I mean, today, uh, year on year, a uh, smaller percentage of our population serves in the military. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that, that we deal with today is, is, the, this, is the civilian world understanding the military, which, which they support uh, as part of that. And uh, there, there's no amount of, uh, uh, of watching film or playing video games or reading books that will, that will that will put you in that position 
uh, it can enlighten you certainly, uh, but it, but at the end of the day, there's uh, that divide is is still there, and it's something that's difficult to overcome. Uh, Tim, back to you. Uh, interesting to see that you have Chinese science fiction. Is there anything in general that makes a difference between European style, American, and Chinese? Yeah, I don't know if there's one specific um, a theme that I can pull out uh, of that yet, uh, John. What, what was interesting, particularly about this author, Xu Shen Lu, is in the book we read, The Three Body Problem, a good portion of the book, almost a third of the book, it takes place during the Chinese Cultural Revolution in the late 1960s. And it's, it's a Chinese citizen's perception of it and that he embedded in this novel, he didn't think it would get past um, the uh, CCP's uh, censors, but it did. He originally had it buried in the middle of the book, but when he published it in the US, it moved to the front of the book. And it, the students, it, it really grabbed the attention of the students because it, it's a telling of that portion of history that most of them were unfamiliar with. Um, there are elements where uh, maybe they're, it's more of a, uh, a societal approach rather than a single, great man approach. Um, maybe that's one minor theme that's in the Chinese science fiction that I've seen so far, but that might be an overstatement. Um, and it's also, uh, you, you have to examine how well, how uh, truly was it translated. And so that's an issue that comes up with Chinese science fiction. We did read a, a short story written by a Chinese author um, about, uh, it was a dystopian short story about words that were forbidden to say in this um, imagined society. He didn't say what, what city it was, but you might guess which city it could be. It might rhyme with Hong Kong. Um, and it's a fascinating story of what this Chinese author had to say about the limiting of speech in this futuristic dystopic world. So, uh, uh, so we'll continue reading some Chinese science fiction in the course uh, and see where else we might expand into the non-Western canon. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, Jay, uh, we got a comment about uh, perhaps uh, more Navy oriented uh, movies, uh, considering uh, where we're sitting. Uh, have you looked at it from a service perspective or have you just selected those you feel make the point that you're looking for in a given case? Uh, it, it is a little bit of both. Uh, one of the problems when choosing films about the Second World War is you sort of very quickly end up in a black hole of of the enormity of number of films that you can uh, you, you can use, uh, there there are more written about uh, about the army and certainly more written about uh, the war in Europe than uh, the war in the Pacific, or more I should say produced about the war in the Pacific or in Europe and in the Pacific. Uh, but a lot of the optional films that they look at uh, are uh, are Navy films. So, uh, for instance, In Harm's Way, uh, uh, which came out in 1965, is a great film uh, that they watch, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, there's several of the, the John Wayne's uh, uh, John Wayne films uh, about the Navy as well uh, that are in there. Um, but there, there are some, uh, as, as this goes on and uh, end up tweaking it uh, a bit, I am going to pull some more Navy films uh, into it in that sense. But a lot of this was, there are a few that are really hard to move. So Patton's a great example of, of a film that you, you really can't talk about the Vietnam War experience without uh, showing Patton as a film uh, for, the, for the reasons of it, uh, of how it comes out and looks at things. Um, and then there are a few iconic films like Saving Private Ryan that comes at a particular time. Uh, one of the optional films that we can certainly, uh, Thin Red Line, which is about Guadalcanal, but that is a uh, bad interpretation of a great book, uh, which is uh, is a problem. The film is is really bad. It also comes out the same year as Saving Private Ryan does, which makes it even worse because that's what it's up against. Uh, but the book is amazing. If you have a chance to go read a you know 700 page book, uh, a, a fictional account of, of uh, Guadalcanal, it's, it's an amazing book. Uh, but the film is is problematic. Uh, but again, uh, yes, uh, trying trying to pull more Navy films into it that sort of fit that. Uh, the the uh, Midway uh, Midway, which came out a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, Greyhound, which came out last year. I haven't seen that film yet. But I've got to uh, uh, got to have a look at that. I've heard mixed reviews about it, so that'll that'll be interesting. Uh, and of course, the course isn't entirely about watching good films. It's about dissecting films and what they say about society. Uh, and I, I've, I've had a good friend who's uh, who uh, uh, is a, a wine connoisseur, and he always says uh, that you've got to drink bad wine to appreciate good wine. 
Uh, so that I think that probably holds true for film film as well as uh, you you might have to look at a few watch a few bad films to really appreciate how good the good ones are. Okay, we're about at the end of our time here. Uh, Jay, any last comments you'd like to add before we close out? Uh, no, I, one thing I would say is uh, we're, we're hoping to bring a version of this, uh, myself, Rick Norton, and Charlie Chadbourne, uh, to the broader Naval War College audience. With, uh, uh, we're, we, we've been talking to, to Dean Hahn and, and some of the leadership about, uh, uh, about having a probably a monthly uh, film event where we would watch a film and discuss it uh, afterwards. Uh, which we're hoping will we'll grow some, get some legs under it and uh, go forward and everybody be able to participate on a, on a large scale. Sounds like a great initiative. Tim, anything uh, in closing on your course or on the electives program in general? Thank you, John. Just about the electives program. It's a team sport. It reflects the passion and creativity of a large number of professors and the staff people, the staff professionals who put it all together. And it gives professors the opportunity to be creative and students the opportunity to learn in in widely and wildly different directions as they uh, as they develop into our future leaders. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. I was very pleased. We didn't know if we'd have 10 people or or 11, but uh, we had over 80 folks here and uh, and that's terrific. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back in two weeks when we'll hear from uh, uh, Tom Nichols about his very interesting book, The Death of Expertise. So thank you very much. Have a good summer and stay cool.